Welcome to the Institute of Real Estate Education's review of the real estate purchase contract. You know, for those of you that are getting into real estate, you really don't have maybe a complete view of what our job is as a good real estate broker. I mean, you think, well, I get a nice car, I'll put the people in the back seat, we'll drive them around, we'll, you know, we'll look at real pretty houses and then then we'll just write it up, you know, and that's pretty much what a lot of people think, but a lot of marketing involved in order to get you in front of the people. But the thing you have to really be licensed for is to fill out this agreement because filling out this contract for a purchase or any of the addendums and including uh, your employment agreement, you know, which is your, your listing contract and whatnot, doing any of that, could be considered a limited practice of law. So that's what it is called a limited practice of law. And so you can tell your, your, your uh, grandma that, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a real estate broker. It's kind of like a limited practice of law, you know. But anyway, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight is a Rep C contract. So uh, with us tonight, of course, is Mr. Dan Naylor, our technical advisor, owner of the school head dishwasher, and it's going to be running the computer tonight. We all you know, go through all those roles all at different times. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Yeah, it's a great company. Great company to be with. Okay, next one, please. You know, it, this would be a great time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Hey, this is great. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to slice this up. We're going to go through the Repsy in order, page by page by page. Okay. Now, if you look at this first page up here at the very top, it says real estate purchase contract. And then the fine print said this is a legally this is a legally binding real estate purchase contract, which we will henceforth call the REPC, R E P C in parenthesis. Uh, Utah law requires real estate agents to use this form. Buyer and seller, however, could agree to use whatever form they want. Now I always point this out to your people because it makes them feel more comfortable. If it is, they know this form was approved by the AG office, or you're going to tell them it was, and uh, and that that all were required to use this form or a different form if they want to have their attorney do a custom form. But that doesn't happen too often because it's expensive uh, and really not necessary. Okay, and and then it also says if you desire legal or tax advice, well, go get it. <laughs> I, I don't do that. And then there's a little section here for your earnest money deposit. Now, we're going to go through all six pages. And I don't expect you to absorb every single thing. But what I would like you to see is right here at where it says one property. See how that's uh, a little bit darker? You know, it's in a different, uh, uh, a heavier font, a different font. So each section would have one of those. Now, this is a uh, section one and then you drop down here section one one included items so if there's any question about what is included in the sale here's where you look and it you know it covers the all these di different things now see this this first line under there says air conditioning fixtures equipment and solar panels so if somebody asks you well there's solar panels yeah it's right there that was printed in the contract that doesn't change now, if you go down to 1.2, it says other included items. In this section, th this is where you could put additional things uh, just for clarification. And there's only two things checked here, refrigerator and uh, mi microwave oven. Now, I would suggest, uh, see where it says other. If there's no other, then write none after that, because that someone couldn't come back and check other <laughs> and then include, you know, the BMW motor motorcycle or, you know, they could, couldn't do that. Okay. So I, I, that's what I would do. Okay. The above checked items shall be conveyed to the buyer under separate bill of sale uh, with warranties to title. Now who backs up all these warranties, the title company with their title insurance. In addition to any, um, a box is checked in this section above. There are or are not additional terms of personal property. A buyer intends to acquire from the seller at closing a separate written agreement. So 
you know, there, there's a side contract. And um, what, what the banks are concerned is they want a copy of everything that has anything to do with this transaction. But it's not really part of the agreement. I mean, that's how we're going to get the money to the closing. So, um, but whatever the underwriter wants or wants proof of, you're going to have to jump through and get it done. Okay. All right. So going back up here again, let's, we're, let's like I said, we're going to go through piece by piece by piece. Let's, uh, let's go back up a little bit this way, Dan. Okay. Now, right up here, here's, here's our earnest money receipt. So forth. In, anyway, it says that at least it describes the day it references the buyer and the seller. Now, if you're working with a buyer and his name is Bob, um, you know, get a clarification when you get to this point to use whatever formal name that they like to use. He may want to use the name William instead of Bob, you know, or maybe Bob's okay with him. I don't know. How do you normally uh, take title to your real estate? And they may say, well, I want to take title uh, in an entity, you know, like a corporation or an LLC or a trust. That's great. No problem. But we're going to need some additional paperwork that shows that they can also sign for that company, you know, for that entity that is the buyer. Okay, how much earnest money? If you had a question on the exam and it said, how much earnest money was done on this particular deal with happy buyer? Well, it's right here, isn't it? You know, it's on the third line down, $2,000. And what form was it in? Was it cash? Was it check? Most brokers don't you want, do not want you taking cash. I mean, that's just a lot of responsibility. You don't want to lose it. I mean, four or $5,000, $10,000 in cash. Usually a check is just fine, but now, you know, it better not bounce. You know, you got to make it real clear to your uh, buyers that, look, this check will be cashed, you know, when, when our offer is accepted. So I thought, well, I thought they'd just carry that, you know, keep the check in a file and then use that at the closing. No. No, in fact, you could, if, if you got a screaming deal on something and then your earnest money bounced and. You know, the seller is absolutely delighted because he sold you the property too cheap and he wants to sell it to the third buyer that showed up after you had it in contract. And so he's just looking for a way to get out of the deal, you know, so he can make an extra 40 grand or, or, or whatever it might have been. Hey, hope you're enjoying the video. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any more of them. And if you want even more review material, we have in the Prep My Exam link in the comments, we've got a plethora of practice exams. We have audiobooks. We have an exam simulator. We have everything that our students use to pass the exam on their first try. Okay? And if you want to get licensed in Utah, check out realestateonlinelearning.com and we'll hook you up. Okay, but that's, you know, not a lot to fill out here, but you can kind of explain that to them. But the most important thing is, I point out that this is a, you know, the, this is our standard form. Now, the last page that we're going to look at, there's another statement similar to this. So you can use the one in the front or the one in the back, uh, or maybe you just both. Okay. Now, here we get into the offer purchase, and this is in section one. And of course, we want to identify the property, and so we put in the common address, you know, one, two, three, uh, Fine Lane, in Good Town. And in here, we didn't put the county in. Maybe you didn't know what it was, but you really should know what, where you're working and what that is. So I put, you know, whether it, it was like a Mesa County or a Utah County or Salt Lake County or whatever, put that in there. And then the zip code. And then this last thing you see on this line is a tax ID number. And that that is a true uh, identifier, probably even better than, than the address. But when... When planning and zoning approves a new subdivision, uh, they're not going to allow another subdivision with the same name as the one that already is in existence. Or if they do, because it's contiguous, maybe it's the same developer. It would be like filing one, filing two, filing three as they went through, you know, the whole different subdivision. So it'd have a master approval over maybe all 135 acres, but they're only improving it in chunks and sections. Okay, so here that we're going to identify the property, but you know, put the county in for heaven's sakes. Okay, any reference below to the term property shall include the properties described above, together with the included items in water rights and in, in water shares. 
There's a whole little uh, paragraph on that. We'll look at that in just a moment. If any, reference in section 1.1, 1.2, and 1.4, okay? So we identify the property, and then there's this kind of a vague thing that says what's included right here in 1.1. .1. Air conditioning fixtures. I mean, if you buy a home, don't you think it should come with the AC? <laughs> or maybe it's just a swamp cooler, but it should come with it. Uh, and equipment, solar panels, if there are any. Ovens, ranges, hoods, cooktops, dishwashers, ceiling fans, water heaters, okay, water softeners, light fixtures, and you cheapskate the bulbs. Bathroom fixtures and bathroom mirrors, all window coverings, including curtains, draperies, and rods, window blinds and shutters, window and door screens, storm doors, window doors, awnings, satellite dishes, on all installed TV monitoring brackets on all wall and ceiling mounted speakers, you know, affixed carpets, automatic garage door openers and the accompanying transmitter, security systems, fencing and any landscaping. Well, that's just printed. You can't actually put anything custom there, but this next little uh, 1.2, you can put other included items and following items are presently owned and placed in the property and have been left for the convenience of the seller. All parties include like washers, dryers, uh, refrigerators and microwave ovens. So on this one, they're including the fridge and the microwave oven, right? Now it's just traditional for the area that you're working in because some of the areas like in the, in the more civilized South, like South Carolina, Alabama, uh, wonderful people. And, but, but anyway, what, what, what happens is they have one way of looking at something and then we have another way of looking at something here in utah so it's it's going to be uh pretty much the same getting a license if you wanted to from one state to another but um but that's what i point out and i'll point out on the last page as well all right so that's how we're identifying and then we had this whole typed out or printed out what's included then we have another section where we can uh get more specific on some things like what you know, microwaves and, what, and whatnot. Then below that, we have some ex excluded items. Now, for whatever reason, this particular seller wants to take the the uh, the drapes that are on the main floor of the house in the playhouse. Now, I I, I don't know. You know, it, it's kind of unusual because drapes are made for a particular window opening. You know, by by size, by dimension. So, you know, chances of you ever owning another house with that exact dimension, I don't know, might, might be good. But, but I don't know, if that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do. The more complicated you make a deal, the harder it is uh, for a seller to accept it because there's just more items to make a decision on. So try to keep your contracts very clear and, and to the point. You know, you don't have to have six pages of addendums unless you need them, okay? And sometimes you do particularly on more uh, complex transactions, uh, maybe even, you know, commercial sales or, uh, and that, and that sort of thing. So let's scroll down a little bit more, Dan. We got 1.3 for the excluded items. Let's put that right at the top. Very good. And then you have water sh shares. Now this particular property uh, doesn't show any, but on the other hand, you didn't put anything in there. So uh, if I, if this, if, if you, if I were tutoring you, I would tell you to write none here, just N-O-N-E, right there in that first line. Because now there's no question, okay, this one doesn't apply. Other, otherwise, some agents write A slash, or N slash A, that stands for not applicable. Uh, but you, know, you, you, do, you do what you're trained to do. Number two, purchase price, okay? Now here's, here's some interesting things here. Look at, look at the very first line here. Well, what are they paying for the house? 340, okay? And then look at the roll of numbers that goes from the top to the bottom, and that says 340. Well, that so here's the 340 they're going to pay, but how it's all broken out is uh, referenced right under 2-1 there. But I've had them come in with their two different figures, <laughs> and it didn't work like that. Okay, so what we got here is we got uh, the 340 is what they want to pay. Look at uh, a 2A, the very top. How much earnest money are they giving? $1,000, but when you get to a certain date, 
they're going to sweeten that and another thousands do. So that would be an interesting question. If it said how much earnest money will be deposited when the contract's accepted, it'd be 2000 because there's another later date. They're going to add some more money, uh, you know, depending on how this is set up or could be set up that way. Uh, but um, so total would be that. Now look at the next figure down here, $240,000, you know, kind of a round balance of, of what they're trying to get a loan. And then they're going to bring in $97,000, which makes uh, our a total of 340. Now, in a very competitive market, what I mean by competitive is, you know, you got 22 buyers looking at six properties, <laughs> you know, so you make an offer and you make another offer, you make another offer, another offer, and you just don't get anything because, they think they're in a seller's market, you know, or excuse me, a buyer's market where they can just, you know, keep chunking away at the, you know, yeah, we want this, we want that, we want your daughter as an indentured servant for two years. Uh, we, you know, I mean, and throw in that Porsche in the garage too. I mean, they get crazy, you know. So uh, it's a great time to get in in into business, by the way, you know, as we look into the the start of the summer of uh, 2024. But you see how those numbers have to line up there. You know, that's 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 quite simple. Now look at two two. The buyer's ability to purchase a contract, uh, the, the the property to obtain the loan reference in two one C above. Now two one C right is two one C. The loan is two hundred forty thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, and uh, is is or is not conditional, and in it in and it's checked is. Most buyers will check. Hey, if I don't get if I don't get my uh, loan, then I can't buy the property. It's not my fault. I we thought we had that all figured out. I mean, I have a pre qualification letter. It's not pre approval. It's pre qualification. Then you go back and verify everything again. Okay, uh, so that's how all that works. Now let's roll up three a little bit higher. Dan, settlement and closing. Now. Settlement closing takes place no later than the, than the, the settlement deadline referenced in, in section 24D or as otherwise mutually agreed in writing. So it could be in an addendum or they could do an extension. You know, maybe it's it, it, they should have had it done, but guys, it's just not going to happen. I mean, it, you know, this is getting late into the day on Friday. Uh, we're going to have to extend the closing till, you know, maybe next Tuesday or something, you know, so uh, because, you know, sometimes it, it just takes a little bit longer to do paperwork than people anticipated. But uh, but both aspirants sort of have to agree. Okay, so so if we're looking at uh, where it changes from page one to page two, it starts a little bit on page one and it says uh, 3.1a, buyer and seller have signed and delivered to each other or to the escrow closing agent, all documents required by the REPC you know, the real estate purchase contract by a lender or by the title company or by escrow closing offices, by written escrow instructions, including any split closing instructions uh, or uh, by applicable law or any money is required to be paid by the buyer and seller under these documents, except for proceeds of any loan uh, have been delivered to the buyer because you know, or the seller that, you know, the pro that we'll do a proration on those, which is an, a little bit different class, but uh, to, to, to the escrow office in the form of cash wire, they don't, don't take cash. They, they, no, no title company wants you walking in there with $75,000. You know, this just, they want, they want a cashier's check or a wire transfer works very well too, or other form of acceptable of closing escrow office. Now look at three, two for purposes of the rep seat closing means that the settlement has been completed by the process, of, uh, by the proceeds of any new loan ha have been delivered to the lender or to the seller or to the escrow closing office. And C, the applicable closing documents have been recorded in the office of the county recorder reporting. And the actions described in 3.2B and C are completed no later than four calendar days after settlement. There's a couple of typical questions in here. In this two dot or through the three dot two, very important. Okay, number one is it defines recording. 
and or, or one of them is it defines recording. Recording occurs when the document pertaining to that contract, that the transferring document, which we call a deed, and there's various kinds of deeds, but that deed was signed and delivered. And then, and then, and then we know it's the other person's property. Okay. Uh, and then it's recorded. Okay. And that's now, do you have to record a deed? No, but it's really foolish if you don't. If you're not recording something like that, it's because you're hiding, you know, and I, uh, no lender is going to let that slide. So, you know, they want their lien recorded for sure. And their lien has no value unless. The order of it was something would be recorded as first the deed that transferred it from the owner, the current, the old owner, the seller, to you, the buyer. Okay, because you can't borrow money in something you don't own. <laughs> so the order of recording is when they take all the stuff down to the county recorder's office, they're going to record that transferring document, that deed first, and they're going to immediately throw on top of that the the recording of the new loan documents, which in our state will be a deed of trust. We don't record the, the notes, but we do record the deed of trust. The deed of trust plus takes the nat note and secures it against the property. Now, another thing we do not record at that particular juncture normally is a release of any existing liens that may already be on that property. Well, like what? Well, mainly an existing lien that most of them are going to have is an old loan that the seller had, and that's going to be paid off by the proceeds some of the down payment the buyer brought in are more likely that and the proceeds of another new loan that's in the buyer's name that will be recorded against the property and that money is, is wired into the title company. Yeah. So title company acts as an intermediary. You know, they're, I mean, look, it, like this is the bag of money, okay? <laughs> and this is the key to the house that, that you want, right? Okay, so I, I want the key. Well. Uh, I won't give you the key until you give me the bag of money. Well, uh, well, why don't you give me the bag of money? Then I'll give you the key. No, you give me the key. Then I'll give you, I mean, you know, I mean that's why there's somebody in the middle. Well, I'll deliver this to the escrow company and there'll be very specific escrow instructions that says this money is not to be delivered until a signed recorded deed has been recorded. You know, and so the title company takes on all the reporting responsibilities and everything. Now, the practical tip here, this is not necessarily for the exam, but a practical tip is when I list a, a house, um, I, uh, I order a title commitment immediately. Now, some may just don't because they say, well, I, if it doesn't close, you know, like if the buyer doesn't get their loan, obviously you're not going to buy them by the house, but there might be some things at the last minute, the snafu on that, or there might be some additional things that people weren't aware of, or they should have been aware of, thousand different reasons why, you know, it might not, the loan might not get approved, but um, if all this stuff has to be coordinated up front, and if there is a title problem on there, it's just a little, little something, okay, I'll give you an example in just a moment. That could kill your whole deal because, uh, you know, the buyer had a lock on their interest rate. The interest rates had gone up, but that that lock was only good for a certain number of days, which is past the days it's going to take us to transfer a good title. And, you know, it's going to be a real mess. So order, I order title commitments up early, and then we can get get about the business of getting that title clear because, you know, in a fast market, you may have, you may only have it listed for a couple of weeks and get several different offers. Well, closing is going to occur when all that's recorded, like we said. Possession occurs when? Upon recording, this, that, or whatever. Okay, now, um, just before we slip into this next section about prorations and everything, which is what the title company is going to do, I want to take these first three sections, and, 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 and I want to tell you that um, getting this stuff all organized, okay, like this loan amount, and how much money am I going to need for the down payment? Is this all the money that the, that the buyer is going to need? No, because in addition to this, there'll be closing costs as well. And some sellers, you know, they're real like engineers and scientific types and people that are have very technical jobs. You know, they're going to want to see all these closings. I mean, you know, just samples. 
and uh, they're just they're just not going to go with the old well you know it takes about two to three percent and for closing costs then i'm six so that's that's about nine eight or nine and so you should net right about right in here you know no they want to see something a lot more detailed than that so uh, you're gonna have to give them kind of a, a summary so in the beginning you're not going to know what to say or exactly how to say it i understand that but uh, I would go to a title company that you think you want to do a lot of business with, and I would have them print out mock closings in different categories, you know, typical expenses. Okay, so uh, so I'm uh, I'm gonna have I I want some four uh, fifties because I'm gonna be selling a few condos. I want some five hundreds, about every fifty thousand, maybe a five fifty, a six six fifty, seven fifty. Now the, these aren't going to take very long for the title guy to do. I mean or lady because they just click in a couple of different hit the buttons and then they hit print and you know the computer they have programs to do all this stuff and then i want you to take those and i want you to put them in a three ring binder with the little plastic protection sheets and just in order so if you're in a home and they say well rick uh, you say that uh, our house could go for about 850 you know, yeah, that, that's what I'm, I'm, you know, that's what, you know, that you and I came up with, right? Yeah. So how much would I net? Okay. Now, uh, if you have all those settlement sheets and their little reminder, you flip up to about 850. And well, here's a sample settlement sheet. Let me just kind of write some of these things down on this blank form. Okay, you should... Based on these figures, which which are you know they're probably overestimated in the cost a little bit, but but I'd rather pay you more than less, okay? Um, and you, and you say your loan balances are right in here, so and there's no other liens or anything against the property, correct? Yeah, all right. So you should net about this much, okay? Now, when you get to the closing itself, usually the title company or the uh, new lender has hired a title company to be the settlement agent representing them and making sure all the loan documents are signed correctly. And then if they if they trust that title company, they've done a lot of business with them. Um, I know some of the are, and, and maybe even if they're local, like Security National, you know, some of these uh, bigger lenders like that, they're, they're insurance companies. They get lots of premiums coming in every month and Part of the way they make a return on their investment as a company and make it a business out of it is taking those monies and investing it and making a return on investment. And they like real estate, although as we roll in here at the beginning of the summer of 2024, you know, we've got lots of problems with commercial real estate, particularly uh, uh, office space. So if you have a small to medium size or even a large company, wow, now is the time to go out and buy facility if you've got the dough. Because, uh, you know, we're seeing some incredible deals, you know, where a few years ago, they wouldn't even talk to you. Well, why would I sell it? I love all this rent coming in. Well, you know, sometimes they're overbuilt. You know, you, it's suspicious when you drive by and, and there's a, a, bu a new, beautiful six, seven foot office building being built. And, uh, but you can see at night through the windows that, you know, the, like most all the floors are empty. Well, they're not going to finish out all those floors until they have tenants for them because different tenants want different office configurations. And so they don't want to do a build out for someone to come in. Well, that we don't need any of this stuff because we have, you know, we have all these little workstations that we bring in. So. And a lot of this will be done at the closing, but if you have a good relationship with your title company and, and when you're ready and you know what you're talking about, I, I, uh, I at least explain always the settlement statements. Now, the title company is not going to let me close the new loan, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> you know, that's 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 what they hired the title company to do. But I can certainly go through the you know settlement statements. So they'll know, Rick, did you want to go through the settlement? Yes, I did. And I'll take them and I'll explain what all the settlement statements are. You know, uh, and that's because that's part of I think part of showing that you're a real professional always asking for referrals okay all right so what we're going to do prorations if the seller's going to own a property for a period of time but not that long who knows might be two years three years but looking at it as a year at a time 
because if we sold that property in you know mid year like it is right now here in Utah, then there's going to be some expenses that aren't going to be charged till the end of the year that the seller really needs to pay his share up to this point. And that's called proration. So, Mr. Seller, that this bill, this tax bill is one of the bigger ones, is not due right now. It's going to be due uh, at the end of the year in, in December, you know, November, December, and that area is when most people pay it. So, because that's so, uh, what, what we need to do is um, take that into consideration because when we split all this up, we have to charge from the first year through the closing date. You know, the seller owns the day of closing, okay? Then the buyer owns it the next day. But for that first part of the year, we need to get some money from the seller to help pay the taxes that won't be charged until we get into the Christmas season, okay? And there's escrow fees, you know, but special assessments, you know, and, and you know, as, you're setting these things, you've learned these definitions. If, if, you, if you don't know the definitions of the words, okay, it's gonna be very difficult to take the test. But a special assessment is a special tax that was only charged for one little area. You know, so a good example is here in Salt Lake Valley is uh, we had Old Sandy, which was built many, many years ago in the 70s, okay? Which, you know, for a lot of us, we remember the 70s, but a lot of you don't, you know, people weren't here then. At least the 60s but anyway in that period of time old sandy wasn't required even the 50s you know some of these houses are from the 50s they didn't require curb and gutter and uh sidewalk so the county you know sandy's and street lights so counties you know dolling things up making it a great modern city and so they wanted to put some of the stuff in but they're not going to charge the whole city of sandy for that improvement just for the subdivisions and you know, the four streets over here and three streets over there that they had to, to, to redo. And so um, prorating something means that, that the seller is going to have to cough up some money to give the buyer because the whole bill is coming due at the end of the year. Okay. And sometimes if you're buying, if you're, if you are assuming a loan, we prorate the interest on that loan too. So there, there's a few things you need to prorate. Don't need it for the sales exam, but as much as, you know, you just don't. But when you get to broker level, those the questions are a little bit more in depth, a little bit more, um, more difficult actually. But by then you'll you'll know more too. Okay, so that's what a special assessment is, and are, are we going to split that up or not? So, I this contract was written the way I would write it, and that is how you see four dot two, and then they want the seller to pay the special assessment. Well, they were assessed, like you know, three years ago, you know, and, and well, we'll give you seven years to pay it off. We'll give you 10 years to pay it off. You know, so the buyer comes and looks at the property and it's got curb and gutter and sidewalk and the street light right out front. Why, this is great. I love this. But now he's got to pay for it in his estimation of what the house was or condo was worth. Here's for the condo. And now uh, that he, he He's he's gonna, the, the tax is going to be based on what it's worth, and so he's going to have we're going to have to prorate all this out. You know, so it's fun, fun anyway. <laughs> it's really cool when you're in an area where you you see a lot of properties of you know like these uh, two story and four and three story apartment buildings in old downtown areas like in Ogden and whatnot, and it, and finally the property gets worth so much that they can come in and take these big D9 caterpillars and just knock the whole building down. They don't even try to save the brick a lot of time. They just knock it down and then they haul it all off and build a big building there. It's fascinating. Okay. Uh, let's see if we can get through the rest of this contract in the next 15 minutes or so. Oh, okay. Anyway, I get excited about this stuff, guys. So, uh, and you know too many Moving things. On. Thanks for sharing it all with us. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and when you pass, we'll go out and celebrate and talk real estate as long as you want. Okay, special assessments, we did that. Okay, fees, costs, escrow fees, we're going to do proration on those. Now, if you're buying a, a property and it's a rental, uh, the uh, tenant put up some dough for damage deposits and stuff. 
Well, the seller's holding that. You're going to want to collect those so that when tenant moves out, there's no damage. They, of course, get their money back. Okay. Then you roll down utility services, sale proceed withholding. Uh, the escrow, which is a title company office, will be withholding whatever it's going to take to make all the uh, uh, payments to the various organizations, like the old loans have to be paid off. Because, you know, the old lender is not going to send out the release documents unless he's got the money. <laughs> so they wire the money. Oh, OK, we got that. Then they then they usually overnight the release documents out. And then the title company goes down and reports it. But a lot of times that could take, you know, weeks, especially if you're dealing with uh, owner carry properties where you have to even track down the seller, which usually is not hard because buyer's been making payments. Okay, confirmation of agency disclosure, you got different opportunities. And this whole big settlement thing you've heard a little bit about and whatnot that NAR just entered into and, and, and it won't take effect for another few months. But hey, guys, no big deal for Utah. We've been doing written buyer contracts in this state for years. We've always had the stance in our state that you have to represent either the buyer or the seller or you can represent both as a limited agent, okay? And that's in, in by put it, filling out the correct blanks on, on number five here, it'd be really, you know, that that's how you do that. Number six, there's not a lot that can be changed on here. Uh, it just says that, you know, that you're, you're gonna get good title and you're gonna get insurance for that. And that's how you know you got good title. Let's, let's roll down, it talks about title insurance on 6.2. And there's something called an ALTA policy, A-L-T-A. And that's not just for ALTA, Utah. ALTA stands for the American Land Title Association. And they came out with some national standards. Real estate is bought all the time across state lines. I mean, you know, I mean, people from all over Utah, in fact, all over the world own property in Park City. And some of our nice risky areas, Deer Valley and whatnot. All right, so going down here, seller has to give a lot of insurance. Okay. Oh, yes, order your commitments early. You know, I mean, I, I have on that cancellation fee I started talking about a few minutes ago, probably not going to be a problem. Okay, uh, written property could do this is what the seller has to provide. I mean, you already have this stuff if you're, um, you know, a good listing agent and on top of things, you know, you pulled all this together. If, if, if it was older in 1978, you got to have the lead-based paint disclosure, commitment of the title insurance. I would get a new title insurance commitment uh, you know, after the deal is accepted right away. Uh, but at least they've already done their preliminary investigation. And that's how I knew if there was a title problem or not. You know, that, and we've been working on maybe we've got it all solved. But... Um, this, these commitments, when they're issued early, like I say, and you know, we got plenty of time to solve the problem. That's usually tracking someone down. You know, I've, man, I've sold stuff that, you know, I wrote Rick Roller on the deed and, and you know, as a, as a seller owner, you know, <laughs> Rick Roller didn't own it. You know, it was Richard R. Roller. So I had to come back and a year later when they wanted to do refinance on a second mortgage or something, and, you know, <laughs> to, to, to clean up. That's what title companies do. They're very meticulous in making sure the chain of title is in good, good shape. But that's what the commitment's for. Copy of any restricted government, uh, covenants. Most all these properties today in modern real estate areas have these. Um, and probably they're, they're not going to give you this information. Uh, they're going to give the seller or the potential buyer, excuse me, they're going to give them uh, a reference point of how they can get it. I insist that they put it on a little thumb drive and you can buy them, you know, I, I get them by the hundreds and two or three bucks or less. And then that, that way you can put that on there and then, uh, but they'll, they'll have that, uh, the restrictive covenants. Okay, copy of long-term tenant agreements, minutes of the homeowners associations, short-term, all these different things have to be provided. But it, if you get it out early, copy of the existing property management agreements, written notice of any claims, you know, seller has environmental problems. And then if, if there are foreign citizens, some additional hoops have to be drunk, uh, jumped through as well. We used to have a lot of people from Mexico City that came and bought properties in Deer Valley. And that even continues today. You know, and uh, but very interesting. Let's go look at uh, 
section eight, please. Okay, now the buyer has a right because you checked is a period of time that they can look at things and decide if they really, really want it or not. Because, you know, I mean, walking through a home in 10, 15 minutes is one thing, coming back and really maybe taking a little film or writing things down, being very careful, taking a lot of time with it uh, is something else entirely. Um, and uh, it's anyway, um, but the, the property, I mean, the market has different demands. If it's a really difficult and competitive market, you're not going to be able to ask the seller for much, but if there, it's not, you probably can. So we want, but all these HOA rules and municipal services and utility costs you see in, in 8A towards the bottom, all that stuff, guys, is just things that you'll work out with the title company. Uh, B, um, buyer's right to cancel and resolve objections. The buyer determines in the buyer's sole discretion if they're within the deadlines, which uh, you know end at five o'clock unless you change it to midnight with an addendum. But uh, the deadline referenced, and if they're within that, they get their money back. If they don't, they they lose their they uh, they could lose the earnest money, or the or the seller could return the earnest money and sue them for actual damages. Okay. Uh, appraisal conditions is or is not. This is subject to an appraisal. Let's move move it up, please. And if they don't like what it came out, you know, they could cancel and get their money back if they're within the deadline. Financing, same thing. Now, do not put people in your car unless you've got a really good lender that has looked at them, talked to them on the phone at the very least, and uh, probably pulled their credit. Maybe, maybe not. But uh, you need to know that, you, look, we work on a contingent fee. If you put two or three worth, weeks worth of work into this, couple and then you find out later they're not even credit worthy this is not the way to go i make them go to the lender first uh, earnest money uh deposits released to the seller uh either buyer or seller who gets the money if they want to can that that can be see if, if you look down in the same paragraph under the three little eyes there it says liquidated damages see that down a little bit further down liquidated damages right there right there okay so uh, they're saying, okay, I'll, I'll accept the earnest money and I won't sue you for anything else. I'll walk away after that. And the number nine, there are or are not addendas. Keep, scroll down some more, please. Is there a home warranty and who's paying for it? Is, is uh, the, the property condition statement? Uh, and then final pre-assessment walkthrough. You know, so you have the right as a buyer to come and if, you know, walk through few days before the closing, just to make sure that it's in the same condition it was when you were there. So if, if, if they're really showing high buyer interest, have them get out their phones and start filming their house. Because they're gonna, you know, look, you and I do this all day for a living, right? When sometimes we're showing it was one of the worst times, it was four people in one day is horrible. Um, which is why you should be a listing agent, <laughs> okay? But it it's um, there's a lot of wheels turning here, guys, and so but you but you you anyway you can do this. All right, so the, all the leases, you know, people are going to want to look at those. Number thirteen, they have the authority to sign for everyone. Number fourteen, section fourteen, this is the whole deal and nothing but the deal and eighteen notices where you give those, right? Move it up a little bit more, please. No assignments, uh, unless you're assigning it something you own, like I'm assigning out of my name into a trust that is for me, for one of my children or whatever. Um, you can assign that way. But we had a lot of flippers that were coming in and they wouldn't even close, but they'd find someone to buy, give them 10 grand for the great contract that they negotiated. Well, anyway, this prohibits that. And unless in that uh, agreement that the, the flipper is using uh, says that no, we're not, we're not, this does, section 19 doesn't apply. Risk or, or loss of risk, obviously it's the seller's house until it's not. So don't let them cancel their insurance too early. And don't let a buyer go into a house you know, early, preferably, because their items will not be covered by their homeowner's insurance until it's actually in their name. 
time is a little persnickety things that sometimes insurance companies, you know, surprise you and enforce them. Most of the time they don't, but you know, but they're, everyone's feeling a pinch right now in business. Time is of the essence. And then that's where five o'clock is, which nobody knows that either point it out to them or put on an addendum. It's 12 midnight because that's, what's going to be happening. You'll be running these things around after the close of business day. And you know, this, anyway, just, just be aware. Counterparts, electronic transmissions are all good. Number 23, acceptance occurs. We define it when everything's been signed. Here's where you have all your uh, last page. Here's where you have all your uh, deadlines and whatnot. So uh, that's, that's where they are. So if the question asks you, somebody, uh, the appraisal came back low, but it came back on January 10th or something like that. Uh, can the seller still cancel? using the uh, appraisal deadline or the uh, uh, appraisal contingency. Now look at look at 24 and see that third line down. It says January 7th. Well, wait a minute. They were two days late. You know, their free look-see ended at five o'clock on um, January 7th, unless they extended it to midnight, but still, you know. Well, that kind of is our end of our discussion tonight about the real estate purchase contract. You need to really, really understand this. Whenever I'm bringing on a new buyer, they're not going to do that. I mean, some will, but the ones that are most persnickety about things, they'll do that, you know, and that's the ones you want to cater to anyway. Well, thanks for being with us tonight, guys. We got not, you know, Dan runs a great school. Things are updated. You're in the right spot if you're in this school. And uh, yeah, we like to throw in some practical tips once in a while because that's the second thing you're worried about. <laughs> Thanks for being with us tonight, and thanks, Dan. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for watching. If you want to show some appreciation to our instructors, be sure to like and subscribe so that they see how much you've enjoyed it. And if you want any additional review material, check the links below for our full suite of practice materials for the real estate license exam. Thank you.